Welcome to Climate Matters. This show was my attempt to try and understand the climate. My interest in climate was peaked in 2006 when I watched An Inconvenient Truth with Al Gore. Like so many people, I wanted to know what was going on. Were we destroying this precious blue planet, our only home? It's the only place I know of that is capable of sustaining life as we know it, at least that is within our technical and technological abilities to uh, get to. So we have to take care of this place because as uh, one French politician put it, there is no planet B. So following the movie, the news kept piling on cascaded into an avalanche of evidence that supported the fact that the earth was warming at a disastrous rate. I read that people were suffering PTSD-related anxiety over the uncontrollable collision course we were on with Climageddon. I was worried. I was worried for myself and I was worried for them. I'd go to dinner parties and around the table climate was on everyone's mind. We were all convinced the world was burning up that snow would disappear, the Arctic and Antarctic were melting, polar bears were dying, and it appeared that there was little hope. At some of those dinner parties, I dared to ask questions about the science, only to be put in my place being told that the science was settled. Apparently, most scientists agree that human activity has now overtaken any and all natural changes that have been occurring for millennia. And it is now human activity that is now the primary driver of climate change. And it is, thankfully, within our power and our responsibility to make things return to normal. So I started to read. The facts seemed incontrovertible. I'm sure I heard Al Gore say that when you take water vapor out of the mix of greenhouse gases, CO2 accounted for 30% of all greenhouse gases. That statement made me wonder, well, if you take water vapor out of the mix, what percentage does water vapor represent? The answer appears to be 80% of total greenhouse gas mass and 90% of greenhouse volume. Then to complicate an appreciation of the effect of water vapor in clouds, you have to take into the fact that they account for 66 to 85% of the greenhouse effect. It's complicated and water vapor plays an enormous role. Okay, I thought, that's odd. If someone's playing with numbers by excluding the major greenhouse gas, what else is being misrepresented? Now, as a little sidebar, it's worth noting, and you'll see what this show runs within the Conversation That Matters channel on YouTube. In 2014, I started the show Conversations That Matter, and where possible, I wanted to interview climate scientists. Finding climate scientists in Vancouver isn't easy. I reached out to the University of British Columbia, and they provided me with a climate science professor. And she provided me with an explanation that fit with the narrative that carbon was destroying the climate and was the major driver in the greenhouse effect. By then I had learned to ask a question about the sun. What about the effect of the sun, I asked her. And she said, oh no, the sun was not a factor because it stays at a constant temperature. I looked it up and she was right. The photosphere of the sun stays at a pretty constant temperature of about 5,600 degrees Celsius. However, at the time, I didn't know to ask the follow-up question about solar energy fluctuations. I knew nothing about solar maximums and solar minimums, and I'd never even heard of solar cycles. On a later show, I had Sapor Berman, the environmental activist who has effectively labeled oil in northern Alberta as dirty oil, and she proclaimed that solar energy was the future. After all, she pointed out, well, you can have an oil spill, you can never have a solar spill. I nodded in agreement, that's a great point. 
At the time, I had little or no information about the vast array of medicals and chemicals that are used in the production of solar panels. I didn't know anything about the decommissioning of solar panels and wind turbine blades, which is a little bit of a side issue. But let's go get back to solar panels. How long do they last? What do you do with them when they no longer work? Is there an aftermarket for them? Oh, apparently there isn't one. So at the moment, they either slowly deteriorate in place or they're rounded up and dumped in a landfill. At least that's what I last read and I'm hoping it's not true. I don't want it to be true because I hope that solar energy production will provide a benefit. And uh, another guess that I had, Justin Woodward, uh, is proving that solar power is vitally important, especially in a place like Malawi, where the sun shines with great regularity and intensity, and he and his company are producing solar power there, and it is really making a difference. It's offsetting the need for other sources of uh, power that's generated primarily through burning diesel. Now, in southern Alberta, Jamie Hussein is doing the same thing. He's built a massive solar farm there. These seem like sensible plans, and of course, I want them to succeed. Where it's practical and affordable, I'm all in favor of adopting programs that ensure we protect our home. But, and here's the thing, the message keeps coming back that we're not doing enough, and the world is disintegrating in front of our eyes. Species are dying. Let's go back to the example of the polar bears. I remember turning to the pages of National Geographic to see polar bears dying, apparently due to melting ice and increasing temperatures in the Arctic. Unfortunately, I then was disappointed to learn that National Geographic had to apologize for putting or printing a story that apparently misrepresented the fact. The polar bear that was shown was actually an old bear who was about to die from natural causes. If I can't trust that magazine, who can I trust? Well, one of the people that I'm sure, and I know that I can trust, is Scott Donny of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. He's a remarkable scientist, and he walked me through the facts about oceans warming. It's not good, he said. And the reason it's not good is the rate at which oceans are warming. It's not unusual for ocean temperature to change, but when the rate of change outpaces the rate that species can adapt, well, then that puts all of those species at risk. I kept interviewing more people. I actually traveled out to Princeton to go see Freeman Dyson at the Institute for Advanced Studies. He was a remarkable guest, and he said that the world is actually getting greener because of an increase in CO2. I went down the road to Princeton University where I interviewed William Happer, who is probably one of the most despised scientists in the climate conversation. Uh, everybody goes after his credentials. They're trying to tear him apart, partly because he has such a remarkable resume. And then I also had Greenpeace co-founder Patrick Moore, who is also disliked by many in the climate uh, conversation. Patrick joined me to tell me the world was actually in a carbon drought. He pointed out that at 280 parts per million, we were just 130 parts per million shy of complete extinction because at 150 parts per million, everything on the earth dies. I checked that out and it's true. Professor Simon Donner, a climate scientist, spoke to the negative consequences of too much carbon. He said, it's a fact that the ICC, IPCC says is irrefutable. I've had a wide variety of guests who speak to how we can change our collective behavior to improve climate outcomes. Guests with incredibly innovative ways of addressing issues of energy production, carbon capturing, and waste reduction. I was, however, having challenges securing an interview with a government or IPCC scientist until mid-2019 when I was able to start to conduct online interviews. That's when I was able to connect with Environment Canada and IPCC climate scientist Greg Flatto on a wide range of questions that had come up through all of these different interviews that I had been doing, and I asked him to help me clear up some of my understanding around the questions that had been raised. He was a remarkable guest. He was patient with me as I asked him to clarify these issues. My objective 
is to try to understand what is happening with climate. I've tried to read the IPCC climate change report. Try is the operative word. I get about five or six paragraphs into it and I start to lose the thread because my exploration of this topic um, is from a layman's perspective. I don't know all of the underlying science. And to read the IPCC report is very, very challenging. You have to have foundational knowledge to know exactly what it is saying, and I don't have that. Now, here's the other thing. Because my exploration of this topic is happening on screen, viewers are sending me a lot of information to help fill in the blanks for me. And I'm endeavoring to understand what is happening, remember, from the perspective of someone who has an emerging understanding of how climate works. It's clear to me it is very, very complex, and science does not give a complete picture all at once. It is the accumulation of many, many studies. So remember, I'm the average person who wants to protect Mother Earth. I want to continue to enjoy the benefits of a modern society, and I want to make decisions that are as informed as possible. That's what this channel is about. That's the point of view. It's a perspective that resonates with a growing number of viewers. Viewers who express their perspectives in the comments section, and I encourage you to do the same. Comments I'm more than happy to see because what's interesting is they ignite other conversations between viewers. Some of them are respectful, others are not. The volume of comments is staggering. Sadly, I can't read them all. Now, writers either celebrate the guest, dismiss the guest, become downright rude. Most make their comments about the guest and others make their comments about me for not being tougher. Many of these comments ask why so many of the predictions by Al Gore and his supporters of his point of view have not materialized in the scientific record. Well, science is not always easy. It is often messy, difficult, and controversial. This is especially true when someone advances a hypothesis that challenges broadly held wisdom or consensus. Today, we live in a world where traditional media, politicians, and social media often appear to behave as if truth can be determined by polls that identify the number or percentage of people or groups who hold a certain point of view. This certainly appears to be true about climate. Unhappily, and this is one thing that I have learned, that is not the way science works. No hypothesis can be validated unless the underlying predictions of the hypothesis are validated by measured, repeatable, empirical evidence. When different and conflicting views arise on any scientific topic, what is required is more conversation, not less. Today, we frequently see social media and even college campuses that demand safe spaces where voices that dissent from the accepted narrative on a wide range of topics are protected. That is, unless it's a topic that the majority does not appear to agree with. Those voices seem to be silenced and deplatformed. We have become exceptionally good at calling one another out rather than calling one another in. On this channel, I want to talk to everyone that will accept my invitation to be a guest, and I will be reaching out to people who have different takes on the science. My intention is to invite guests with scientific credentials, not just opinions. Surely, on a topic that affects the future of everyone on the globe and could involve massive shifts in human behavior and with requirements for massive public sp spending of public resources and taxes, we owe it to ourselves to have as fulsome and broad-ranging debate on this topic as is possible. Hopefully, encouraging conversation and listening will lend to broader support for measures that can be scientifically demonstrated to be beneficial for all of us. I want to emphasize, being tough on my guests is not what conversations is all about. This channel is about a respectful conversation with a person who has credible knowledge. Going forward, I'm going to start to produce more of these conversations with a wide, wide and widening circle of experts. 
And of course, I can do this now thanks to the quality of the online video and audio we can record. As this channel unfolds, I'll be reading as many comments as I can. I'll consider suggested guests and, where possible, extend an invitation to them to join me here on this channel. If you like this channel, then please help me to produce it. It's taking so much of my time, it's pinching upon my ability to do anything else. So please stay tuned. Subscribe, comment, share, and support us by becoming a Patreon. Mm -hmm.